Hey guys, uh, so I just hit 90,000 subscribers, big day, milestones, and all that. Uh, sometimes I celebrate these, sometimes I don't, and I do it in different levels of intensity or different ways. I don't know, whatever strikes me. Today, I had this particular feeling, and by today I mean tomorrow, when I'm making and editing this whole thing. Uh, I wanted to do something a little indulgent and spread the wealth a little bit, although I don't know how effective this will be. This might be a huge waste of time. Uh, but... One of the weird phenomenons that happens when you have a YouTube channel and it's growing and all that is you see the numbers But also you're like terminally online and You're always like watching videos and you're living on this platform too and you see other people's profiles and you see their numbers and you're like But my number what that's not that's impossible because you have like all these established people some of them have been around longer than you have, some of them maybe not so much, but like there's just sort of channels that you see that put a bunch of work into their stuff and you value what they make and so on. And then you just see like, oh, I'm, I have more subscribers? What is that? How is it even possible? No, that doesn't, that doesn't click right in my brain. That doesn't register as true, even though it's clearly there in front of me. So I want to try to spread the wealth or something in shine a light and use whatever platform I have to pay attention to particular channels and try to send people over there if I can. Historically, I don't know if I really have that much click-through potential. I don't know if I really have that much pull to motivate people to go to particular places and check things out, but prove me wrong. Check it. <laughs> Please prove me wrong. Uh, also, I, I feel like I could use a break lately from... Uh, Let's plays a little bit or just in general like there's a the, uh, my state's on fire. I don't know if you guys know that my state is on fire uh, I, I know that's not even news anymore California being on fire all the time, but in particular uh, yesterday I got through like one episode of something and My throat got all scratchy and a weird feeling and it kind of persisted all day Through the, over the course of my recordings and through sleeping and everything and I'm like I might need to cut back on Recordings or something lately, so I'm a little worried about that. I might need to get like an air purifier and a humidifier or something. Like I don't know if the air is too polluted or if it's too dry or something, but it's like it might interfere with my ability to record for extended sessions and whatnot. So I might have to figure <coughs> something else out about about that. I don't know. Uh, definitely would like to be somewhere else right right about now. Uh, Bird is up in Seattle, and uh, he said that he's not coming to tonight's multiplayer session because he's taken to wearing a mask, like a breathing mask, indoors because the air is so bad there too. It's just like this is a this is a bad time. Anyway, not totally related, but hey, so this will be the one and only video today because I just kind of want to indulge and also because it's going to take a while to record but hey it'll help me relax my voice a little bit because i only have to record a few minutes at a time i'm going to make this whole thing in piecemeal and edit each chunk as i record it uh this is not scripted and planned because that's the kind of channel that i've got uh yeah <laughs> yeah hopefully only recording like a minute or two at a time and then editing will not put strain on my voice and at the same time hopefully if I upload nothing else today and this is the only video you guys get you'll actually click on it experimenting so if you're wondering how I populated this list I kind of went through my recommended videos playlist which if you don't know I have a recommended videos playlist that's public on my profile you can find it on my front page somewhere or just by like searching within my profile for it but just periodically I just if I find something I want to recommend then I just slap it on here and so, in, in part of the process for populating this list, I just kind of scrolled through here and found, and just looked, ch checked anyone that I thought was of a sufficiently small channel size, and then compiled all of the ones that are 90,000 subscribers or below. And then, because uh, that's when, where I am at the moment, and then sorted them in ascending order. So... If people have short attention spans and don't make it through this whole video or whatever, uh, the people who have the smallest subscriber counts will be featured first, and the people with the largest subscriber counts will be featured last. So hopefully those people at the at the beginning get the most exposure or something. I don't know. I am definitely making this up as I go along. Anyway, first channel on the list is Electron Dance, a channel I miss. <laughs> 
uh, my level of uh, memory and knowledge of each channel might vary a little bit from channel to channel because it's a lot of channels. More channels than I thought, honestly. I, the number of th things that qualified as being under 90,000 subscribers but featuring content that I care for quite a bit was a, a lot of channels. I, I guess I'm subscribed to a lot of channels in general. But in some cases, yeah, I might have might have a perfect memory for describing some of these things uh, because it's maybe been a long time since they last uploaded or it's just not super fresh in my memory or so on. But if it's on this list, then it at least qualifies as me remembering specific like, oh, yeah, I really like their stuff and I, I want to see more of it in the future. Like it's a name that I'd be happy to see again in my subscription feed. And so I want to share it with yours. And so... Electron Dance was an odd one, so they haven't uploaded a video this year, unfortunately, and that's a bummer. But in particular, I remember their No Man's Sky video and their Witness video, both of which I think were in my recommended videos playlist. And they had this particular style of video essay crossed with documentary, crossed with like making your own art in the form of like almost a short film. Like they were. I remember them being intensely creative videos that were that were very watchable in their own stake, just even like irrespective of the actual thing that they're based on. But if you if you actually knew about the game being talked about, like No Man's Sky or The Witness and so on, like this thing really kind of enhanced your appreciation for aspects of it. And they're just really really creative videos that I would like to see more of. So here I am selfishly pointing you at this channel to hope to help motivate the idea that maybe I'll get more in the future. See, this is entire, entirely self-serving. A prize awaits you at the peak. But the statues there are trying to warn you about devoting yourself single-mindedly to a cause. The man with the hammer attacks the great arch defiantly, but his strength achieves naught. Another dies on the arch itself. This man believes he has all the answers in his book, and steps off to his doom. The creators are spent, but find nothing of worth in their success. It is a thinker's graveyard. Once you've unlocked the peak, there is only one way to go. Down. And you keep working, keep digging, keep solving. The puzzles reject you, and become physically unpleasant to solve. Where you once embraced the mountain climb metaphor, you ignore what it means to descend through the mountain's dark belly. I'm going to go ahead and include a short clip from each channel as I mentioned them because in many cases them speaking for themselves will be a better representation of who they are and what they do than anything that I'm saying about them anyway. Uh, but if you want to watch the full video of each clip that, that each clip is from, you can just go down to the description and click the link following the name that is shown on the screen and all that. The, the, I'll be linking to each video discussed in this video and then uh, you can subscribe via that page if you think you want to see more from that channel. Anyway, here we've got Conquest of Dread, which is another channel hovering around 5,000 subscribers, which is just a thing that does not make sense to me. They've also got some next level production values and editing and effects and so on that's just kind of neat to watch, and I'm kind of like taken aback by both him and the previous channel with just how much work looks like it goes into each video and how they just keep chugging along despite the relative lack of feedback and support over the over the course of like months or years and so on all the more incentive to make a video like this i suppose uh, i found this channel via the why aquaman sucks video which it, like many videos you're going to see throughout this particular promotion video thing whatever the hell this thing is that i'm making right now uh it's another chance to to view media through the eyes of a different person. You're going to see people on this list that are from different uh, racial groups, different uh, sexual identities. You're going to see asexual people, non-binary people, LGBT people, uh, women, and so on. And that's, it's just valuable. And I want to promote that kind of stuff. And this kind this channel kind of uh, this this video kind of almost accidentally became a montage of a lot of those kinds of people just because I guess that's the particular cross-section between channels that I enjoy and would like to share and also happen to not have a lot of following and I wonder if if that has anything to do with each other at all. That's It's kind of a bummer actually how often uh, they're just not where I would love to, for them to be.
But in this case, we have an, a take on the Aquaman movie from somebody who is of, of Maori descent, and you just get to see new insights as a result, and that's just way more interesting than the next BuzzFeed review or whatever. One thing that we see come up constantly in media portrayals of indigenous people is what's called the noble savage trope. It's this concept of a character who comes from a culture more removed from technology, and thus closer to the land and animals. Which isn't necessarily always a bad thing, but often this strips a lot of depth from characters, reducing them to just that. A character defined only by these things. Living in the forest, constantly making astute philosophical observations about the way the wind whistles through the grass, and teaching all other characters about the virtues of a quiet life in harmony with nature, as if indigenous people don't play PlayStation or live in apartments. An important thing to remember is that it's entirely possible to have characters that take inspiration from their ancestors through traditional cultural practices and philosophy without actually having them frozen in time. Next up we've got Cass Eris, who I primarily found because they have a 30 episode still ongoing uh, series on Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules to Life and just the all around disaster that it is. And she's a cognitive psychologist and has a particular, a lot of insight to offer this particular subject. And it's just been an interesting ride and also all the more alarming due to the people in my life that I know have cited that they're going through the 12 Rules to Life book and they found it very interesting or whatever. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so on some level, it's been a little cathartic just to watch somebody tear through it for admittedly a very long time i'm i've, I've been while well, i've been doing like late night world of warcraft stupid grinding sessions and whatnot i've been making my way through like 20 plus episodes so far of this series and that's been very interesting but i want to point you towards in particular this video that's called stereotype threat in education and gaming because that's just an interesting take on what it's like to be a, a woman in the gaming er a sphere and what that how that affects people and I think a lot of people in the audience will relate to that and those are the, the them that can't relate to it could really do with learning something from it. I was much further along in the process of completing this weapon than he was, so I was given preference in completing it first. This pissed him off royally. He threw a bit of a tantrum with the officers of the guild, which was sort of private. Uh, but one of the officers was sort of friends and was more than happy to tell me everything that this guy was saying. Kind of wish he hadn't. So when it became clear that this guy wasn't going to get his way, he quit playing WoW. Because of me. I eventually completed Shadowmourne, but couldn't really feel happy about it. Even to this day, I feel a stupid amount of shame about all of this. With the new weapon, my DPS went up by a bit but not as much as the guy in charge of the physical DPS had expected. So, I started getting a lot of unsolicited coaching advice from the guy in charge of the physical DPS. I almost quit. I was... Because he suggested that I run a timed macro. All I'd have to do is push a button, and it would do the rest. Next up we have Laura Crone, who's doing a series on Marvel heroes and how they are applicable to, like, this personality classification system which i don't necessarily care about that like that classification system necessarily but as she promised at the beginning it's even if you don't care about the actual system being discussed it's still an interesting interesting topic to go through and that's proven largely correct because it actually is pretty compelling and to the point where i'm starting to wonder if the people setting up the marvel universe actually looked at that personality classification system and base their characters on it because honestly it's got me thinking like if I were to make like a fictional universe that I had to like populate with interesting characters that would come into conflict with each other and also have like personal flaws and growth and regression and so on I might look at this classification system as a starting point to figure out how to construct different personalities and all that so that's been a pretty interesting system a series, and that's the majority of her recent videos. But the reason I found her was actually the Invisible Stunts video, which is a video she did on Invisible Man, and just discussing the stunt work that goes into a movie like that. In a movie that you kind of wouldn't traditionally, as a layman, assume uh, even involves stunts that much. But 
as she shows, that involves all sorts of stunts in all sorts of different ways. And some of them are using the actors, and some of them are using stuntmen and so on. And since she has experience as a stuntman, she has her own perspective to bring in. And that's the fun of diving into these topics with people that know what they're talking about. Just like there's a difference between falling from kneeling and falling from standing, there's a significant difference between falling from standing and falling from even the bottom stair, and you're gonna pay for every inch of it. So we've got could have been a fall but wasn't, out of frame, out of frame, crumple, 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 and a clever little camera move before he'd need to face plant out of it. Very nice. Crumple, crumple, crumply wreck, crumply wreck, crumply wreck. Wreck the bed, though. That's a great use of the set because that's basically a crash mat that doesn't have to be hidden. Wreck, wreck. That's a fun one. I'm remembering that. You get to land on both thighs and a butt cheek. That's smart. Now up to 12,000 subscribers, we have David J. Bradley, an asexual man whose video on house I found because uh, the algorithm, I guess, just served it up one day and I was happy that it did. Uh, it was essentially about this mean-spirited episode of house where house just kind of proves that asexual people don't exist more or less it's kind of brutal it's not really like the point of the video isn't like oh god this trash show how dare it delete it from all of existence or anything it's more like just was that necessary why 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 make why make that episode what is your goal here and from that and then from there there was a natural transition to, to his uh video on masculinity and just kind of understanding himself and so on as a, and like these videos are really interesting and like this kind of content is fairly important online because it, it it's people who have kind of figured themselves out at least on some level sharing their experiences and perspectives online and then that like young people can find that stuff and they can suddenly have this new perspective and new words to explain the feelings that they're feeling and maybe even the first chance to feel like there's an understanding of what they are and how they feel in a way that they've never really had the perspective for because they've never met anyone who could explain these ideas to them. And that's always really neat. The traditional mode of masculinity, which, as we've said, no longer really fits in with the world, is still pushed onto men from a very young age. But because of how ill-fitting it is for the times that we live in, men cannot hope to be that if they ever could. You're trying to match up to this aspiration and you've got all these other people telling you to do it and you can't and it forms something of a clash in your head because you know that you're meant to be this fantasy idea of a man and it isn't possible and it just gets so frustrating. Then layered on top of that, you see men who aren't trying to do this. Men who are subverting their gender performance, which is something I'll get into more a bit later. And you start to think, well, why are they doing it like me? They're doing it wrong, I'm doing it right, and you need to confirm this to yourself. So you double down on these ideas of masculinity that you've built up, and you push anything else aside. And this is where it can become easily toxic. You may notice that I'm getting a little briefer with each little summary, because I'm having like the realization that if I, keep, if I let myself rumble, ramble on and on, I will never get this video done, and it will be three hours long. Next up is Infernaut, at about 18,000 subscribers, and the standout video for this particular channel for me was You Couldn't Make Blazing Saddles Today, which drew me in with the fact that it... Uh, is a quote I've heard too many times from too many different people to the point where I'm really wondering why they're all saying it and where they all got it from, where they all got this shared idea together. But they go through and they analyze this movie and recontextualize it in, like it's, well, not even recontextualize it. They show it in its original context and what it meant for the Western genre at the time, how it kind of broke the whole genre over its knee, and how in some ways it may have been actually kind of this progressive voice, despite the fact that people that are kind of anti-progressive tend to specifically rally around it today. Those who espouse it usually do so to express the belief that people are just too sensitive today, that a controversial, edgy, witty, and cerebral comedy like Blazing Saddles wouldn't be accepted by today's sensitive and coddled audience, that there was a time when movies were like this. They weren't afraid to offend people. A joke was just a joke, and a movie was just a movie. You couldn't make Blazing Saddles today. And the funny thing is, as wrote and played out as these words are, well, they're true. You really couldn't make Blazing Saddles today, but not for the reasons most people think. In fact, I think that the sentiment does the film and its legacy a huge disservice. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Blazing Saddles, its place in film history, and what it means to cinema today. 
hopefully by the time I'm done, I will have made my point that I think a far more fitting phrase would be, why would you make Blazing Saddles today? Next we have James Summerton, who has been making these extensive borderline documentary videos about queer media. Uh, Monsters in the Closet, I believe, was a, was a video about the history of LGBT representation in uh, film media from the very beginning and how it interacted with the Hayes Code and why so many villains are coded as effeminate men and so on. Then there's the whole trilogy of videos there about queer baiting and all the different ways that like LGBT aspects are used for marketing while often reneged in the actual real material and so on. And then there's even a 90 minute, almost 90 minute video about uh, the history of gay porn and how that went through the AIDS crisis and that the number of complications there. And it's just a very, it's, I mean, I keep saying that I, I'm just, I'm just going to keep calling things interesting today, aren't I? This is why people write scripts. Deadline reported that executives at Disney thought Love, Victor wasn't family friendly enough for the brand. I wonder what wasn't family friendly enough about it. One needs to ask, what would it have meant for a generation of queer kids to see a show representing them on a Disney platform? You don't get much more mainstream than Disney. That might have given hope to queer kids who are held down by their homophobic or transphobic families or communities. And while many queer youth avoided Love, Simon in theaters for fear of being spotted seeing a gay movie, this TV sequel could have allowed them to take in a cute gay teen comedy from the comfort of their own laptop or phone. A possibility made all the more likely with how popular Love, Simon has been on streaming. With Disney Plus in almost 50 million households by the time Love, Victor was released this June, that would have been a gigantic potential audience. But Hulu isn't in as nearly many homes. It isn't nearly as mainstream. Disney had the opportunity to say to those gay kids, your stories are as good as anyone else's. But now, by shafting it over to Hulu, the mouse has unequivocally said, you don't belong here. Next up, we've got Kay and Skittles, who I originally found because of their video on the politics in Fallout. And then I went on to watch a video I quite liked called Us, the Horror of the Middle Class Anxieties. There's no the in there. I added that and it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and then I wanted to watch more videos by them and largely found that I actually couldn't because uh, Midsummer and The Lighthouse and Legends of Korra are all on my to-do list. I haven't watched any of those yet, so spoilers so i have i have a dedicated i have so many like watch later playlists that are organized in different ways and one of them is just called spoilers and it's just like here's a thing to check periodically to see have you watched any of the stuff that's in here yet good now you can finally watch these things be it like 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 like, like i'm just now playing skyward sword so now i can go watch skyward sword let's plays by my favorite channels that i've been ignoring until now and so on and similar for that uh but yeah let's just, let's play the clip editor that exists it is not me right and any suspicion that this was just going to be another fear-mongering home invasion film is dashed just like that the relatively well-off are scared of the poor for one simple reason they know their comfort is only possible because of the suffering of the poor it's normally left in the subtext of home invasion films to the extent that you wonder if the creator even thought about what they were doing. But what Jordan Peele does in Us is put it right there in the text, which frees him to then explore what that means. This one kind of hurts my soul. <laughs> so Strucci Movies is one of my favorite channels and is tragically, tragically small, at least by subscriber count. Uh, if you just take a glance at the channel, your first impression is that there's more like, sort of like these uh, weekly re or monthly ish reviews, just kind of these occasional videos. And that is more or less true. That's that's sort of arguably kind of the filler content. That's like the the backbone of the whole thing that kind of like, you know, keeps the channel busy. But there's these very occasional, very, very good big documentaries, in particular, the fake friends series, which has been influential to me, and if you ever heard me mention parasocial relationships or anything like that, or if you heard even other people mentioning them to any real amount online, in many cases, it's because we've all watched these videos. The Fake Friends videos are really good and insightful, and they 
are completely about the relationship that you and I have with each other and what that means and the good and bad ways that that can go and the ways that can like like the, in some ways it can help people but in other ways it can be massively exploitative or unhealthy and the different ways that that manifests and I have rewatched these videos many times at this point here's your periodic uh, reminder that all of these things that I'm uh, talking about here are linked in the description uh, fake friends part two in particular is very good but there's no real reason to skip over part one because it's only like 20 minutes long and it is a sequential series and all that sequential series good job buddy while the other animals paid no attention to the cardboard cutouts in their midst grape coon became so enamored by his 2d visitor that he couldn't tear his eyes away from her and it wasn't long before photos began surfacing online showing the penguin staring up at her for hours at a time and refusing to leave her side it was so all-consuming that he neglected to eat his meals meaning zookeepers had to remove the cutout when the cutout was taken away, Grape Coon began eating again, but it was obvious that he was deeply missing his cardboard soulmate. After some time, Grape Coon fell ill and was dying. In a Straits Times article, Tobu Zoo's penguin caretaker, Eri Namoto, said, We put the cardboard panel next to him to comfort him to the very end. I'm really happy that video's back, actually, because it got taken down by a copyright strike for, like, months and months, and there was a bunch of back-and-forth disputes, and it finally got resolved, and that was just... It was just good to know that I could watch it again. Uh, next up we got Gold Vision, who's kind of a... Who, how do you call it? Philosophical comedy, let's play, highlight, post-commentary, something? It's a little tough. They're not... It's like its own category of thing, it's hard to explain. I've always loved this channel, though, for years now. Uh, they're not video essays, they're not reviews, they're just kind of... Ponderings? I suppose. Uh, he has this particular laid-back, almost deadpan tone that kind of lulls you into this almost like a sense of security where the comedy sneaks up on you. <laughs> and it's uh, there's some interesting series here. They had a check. He had a checkpoint series of a uh, planet side that was him kind of going from place to place in planet side and kind of making these little scripted videos about that. Uh, he had a pacifist GTA series where he would play in GTA 5 in the open world, but just not engage in any violence and see how and f try to figure out how to make money without fighting anybody or killing anyone and so on and just kind of go going on that. And then he kind of extended that to like a year long or more thing or might just be might still be a permanent thing that he's still doing even where he just does not commit violence in games and just kind of approaches them via a completely alternate way like I do remember that he has a he has some videos about the new Animal Crossing where he's trying to figure out how where he's trying to apply that 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 thought process to the games themselves so it's just a different way of viewing games at times and that can be fun but he's just he just made me laugh like a deceptive number of times and then the second amendment sounds great I'll pick the um let's see the 18th century can't no here okay this one's called the assault weapon it says it's good for 30 to 50 hogs there's more bill of rights to get through i guess but i'm not sure how many more rights i'm gonna need now that i got this thing you might be noticing that while i make let's plays there aren't really let's play c content in here so if any gaming stuff comes up it's definitely edited scripted content its own i just i don't, honestly i just don't really watch that many let's plays Although it probably wouldn't be in my best interest to actively recommend other channels that demand your attention on a daily basis. <laughs> uh, next up we got Broy Deschanel, who I found when I was on my kick of having just watched Parasite. And so I was just trying to find any discourse about Parasite that was particularly interesting because I just wanted to discuss and think about Parasite more on a number of levels. And then I pr quickly... Uh, binged her entire channel, uh, which admittedly is not especially difficult to do. And actually, the, her most recent video is relatively is actually a pretty interesting uh, jumping in point, which is a analysis and somewhat defense of Sofia Coppola and just really just a general take on how feminine media is kind of looked down upon and seen as separate, lesser and lesser than more masculine takes. For example, the ongoing issue where, like, we always talk about auteur theory, both in gaming and movies, but boy, is it always a dude. Roger Ebert defended Marie Antoinette beautifully. 
Every criticism I have read of this film would alter its fragile magic and reduce its romantic and tragic poignancy to the level of an instructional film. This is Sofia Coppola's third film centering on the loneliness of being female and surrounded by a world that knows how to use you, but not how to value and understand you. Rather than a depiction of Marie Antoinette the ruler, Coppola gave us a depiction of Marie Antoinette the girl. Of course, the film deviates far from historical accuracy, as Antoinette actually played a much larger role in the political decision-making of her notoriously indecisive husband. But Coppola's goal was to convey the mood of a teenager. The montages of treats and clothes and parties are paralleled almost one for one with shots of the Dauphine crying alone in an ornate room or sitting still amidst a mass of bustling court folk. These subtle shots tell us all we need to know about what's going on inside her head. The vapidness of the imagery is a facade for the unbearable loneliness lurking beneath. Curio is a video essayist who just recently came out as non-binary, who has a, a series of good videos on, say, Catherine and the Joker and a number of things, and currently has an ongoing series on Netflix's The Witcher, which part two of just came out while I'm making this. Now I really want to finish making this video so I can go watch it. This is Geralt's one big speech moment in the show, and it's just the setup for him showing his whole entire ass. Even the slick quote Geralt says is designed to, after a moment's inspection, be obviously nonsense. You can't just respond to a question by deriding the basic notion of choice. Ice cream is ice cream, Stregobor. Sweet. Delicious. Cold. It's all the same. So if I'm to choose between chocolate chip and raspberry ripple, I'd rather not choose at all. The whole Witcher series sees Geralt slowly realize that he has to get involved and care for people. It's kinda his central arc. Still somehow centrists take this away as a pro-centrist story because of that one line, but what does this actually say? It says that if you try not to pick a side, all you'll end up doing is helping the worst side and making things even shittier than they were going to turn out anyway. The storyteller is a recent find, and I've only watched about half a dozen of their videos so far, but so far I generally kind of summarize it as being like defunct land, but for the boondocks. Boondocks branding on the channel, Boondocks comes up in the naming or theming of every other video I've seen by them, and it's just a really... I'm gonna... I caught myself saying interesting again. <laughs> how do you... how do you say... how do you do like 30 similar intros and not say the word interesting? <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely going to be watching the rest of the content on this channel. When you push a specific image of blackness and it's mostly negative, people are naturally going to have a negative image of black people. There's a lot of white and even non-white people that don't actually have a lot of black friends. So their only idea of blackness comes from the things they consume. And if all you consume is propaganda surrounding how ignorant and needlessly violent our culture is, that's all you're going to think of us. You can't be the proud, noble fighter when every single time someone sees a person that looks like you on television, they're acting like a damn fool. How would they know, how would they know you're not a damn fool? You think they're gonna talk to you? Yeah, right. All right, 55K, we're making progress through this backlog. I made a project for myself today, didn't I? So next up is Creel Tube, and he's a video game reviewer of sorts, but it's one of those people where it's kind of an excuse to do skits and whatnot, and he has the particular flavor of the fact that he animates over these videos in a way that is just like lar it's just largely forgotten, really. Like the only, it's like the only other one they can think of even kind of is Sequelitis, and that was such a short-lived series by comparison. But he's been plugging away for years, and uh, there's even a few videos on here that are just completely like standalone uh, animated cartoon comedy sketches with no game at all, and some of them are just kind of get, starting to get this big, crazy continuity thing where there's a younger version of himself, and there's just, there's just some fun here, but it's uh, it's good stuff, and it clearly takes a lot of work, and it needs more views now, please. Alligator Mississippiensis. Big deal, look how stupid this thing looks, look at it. You're not gonna get it, dummy. Ah, oh, he's trying real hard. Oh, I bet he is. He won't succeed with a brain like that, though. You ever seen an alligator brain? <laughs> Come here. You see that thing in the skull right here? That's a bowl of mashed potatoes. That's their brain. It's pure mush. It's the stupidest thing you'll ever see. They're just dumb as shit. <laughs> this guy can't even do two plus two. Wow. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, look at him. He can't even hold the pencil right. It's five, you more. Wait. 
Next up is Yara Zaid, which, funny story, uh, Stephanie and I both found this channel separately from each other and started talking about the same video essay without knowing that we were talking about it at first, which is this Jennifer Bo Jennifer's Body video, which is about, in general, like, how Jennifer's Body kind of became a cult classic despite kind of being seen as trash at its first, like, launch, and a lot of that being kind of due to some distressing misogynist undertones and also some bad advertising and marketing that misrepresented what kind of movie it was going to be a little bit. And also the fact that, frankly, Megan Fox was treated very poorly by Michael Bay and that affected her career consistently and like it just didn't matter if she had any talent or what she did in any movie because there was a label that was attached to her and it just stuck no matter what. And this will actually make you feel for her. It's a, it's a, it's a bummer to think back to. And in the end, when filming was wrapped, most involved were happy with what they made. Then it was released in theaters and torn to shreds. There are a lot better ways to do it than subjecting yourself to this. We've seen episodes of Supernatural that are scarier. Megan Fox has a no nudity clause in her contract. What? The reviews quoted have one thing in common, and that is how they sexualize Megan Fox. Now, you're probably shaking your head thinking of that scene in Transformers, the scene where most audiences were introduced to her for the first time. Not wise people who recognize Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen as their lord and savior. You're thinking of the scene where she's checking a car engine and you're thinking, no, Megan Fox has always been sexualized. And you'd be right. From the moment Transformers hit theaters, from the moment that the scene played on silver screens, it sealed Hollywood's perception of Megan Fox as a sex So yeah, the last video comes both me approved and Stephanie approved. Next up is Jose, who I think in part kind of focuses on these retrospectives from a left-leaning perspective of family television Specifically, I mean shows about families that, that aired in like the 80s and the 90s and so on. This kind of nostalgic period from when I was growing up. So you have Home Improvement and you have Married with Children and you have Roseanne and the Connors. And those were all really compelling watches. They're, they're, they're retrospectives of the entire show. They show the rise and fall of certain elements and like the strong seasons, the weak seasons. Uh, but also really interesting analysis on things like, like for example, Roseanne. Like, my primary exposure to, to that, because I never really quite watched the show or a lot of these shows growing up, necessarily, uh, I'm just used to hearing about how Roseanne herself is garbage in real life. And so that kind of turns you off of the entire idea of the show. So finding out that the show is actually this, like, really interesting look on working class families genuinely struggling and the kind of troubles that they face under capitalism and so on. It's like, it's like way more compelling of a show than I, than I thought. And suddenly I'm way more interested in watching these shows than I would have been otherwise. Uh, but I got to admit that I, I just, even if it's just junk food or whatever, like I, I, I got, I got to recommend the video where he just dunks on uh, Ben Shapiro's self, like wish fulfillment, embarrassing conservative fiction and oh what a ride one thing we get a lot of in this 266 page book is characters dozens of them many appearing for no more than a few paragraphs but what's most telling is how these characters are presented to us let's take the subplot of ricky o'sullivan shooting the eight-year-old boy the boy's name is kendrick malone though we don't even learn that until after he's been murdered the scene where the two encounter one another is told entirely from Ricky's perspective. We see the fear, doubt, and regret through his eyes, creating sympathy for the character. We never get Kendrick's perspective. Part of that may be because they were trying to hide that this was a setup, but even after he dies, we do meet his mother, Regina Malone, who is briefly described as a slightly overweight black woman. And that's about it. She's never a focal point. We never really learn anything about her aside that she's being used as a prop by Levon and Jim. The Malone family, although victims in this narrative, are without a story or perspective. They're just props being used to tell us the story of a sympathetic police officer and two conniving civil rights frauds. Lady Knight the Brave. I really love this channel. I really do. Uh, She's made excellent videos on Russian Doll, on Fleabag, on The Last of Us. It's my personal favorite Last of Us video essay. Uh, the Jojo Rabbit one's great, A Knight's Tale. There's a lot of really good stuff on this channel, and it's relatively short 
stack of videos. Russian Doll in particular, though, like that's a very underappreciated show that I don't feel like comes up very much. And just all, I, I feel like there was a lot more insight that helped me appreciate the show all the more. And that's one of the best things that a video essay can do is take something that you already appreciate or enjoy or so on, and then adding a bunch of new texture to that and maybe even encouraging you to watch it again and with that, with that context and like, you know, give, giving you more value essentially for the thing that you already like. And that the, the, these are these videos are all great for that. These are all celebrations of media and I, and I like them a lot. But this show does it so well in giving us this really interesting Jewish woman who is so unapologetically herself. She is both defined by her history and culture. I told you my grandparents are Holocaust survivors, right? I'm sorry, but... It's not on you. And defiant of it. We're Jewishy. Hey, come on. Religion is dumb as fuck. Leon had this to say on the subject of her own faith when she posed as Yentl for the cover of Tablet Magazine in 2016. I am in conflict with my heritage, and there is an element of integrity to my own conflicted views. Posing as Yentl seemed like the perfect way to reconcile my complicated feelings about Judaism, but I also feel very connected to it. And it appears she passed those conflicts and contradictions onto her fictional doppelganger. I've been editing this video as I go, and it's kind of being intentionally edited to be frustrating, or at least in a way that frustrates me, where I get just enough of a thought that you latch onto it a little bit and you just, you just want to see the rest of what happens. And so I, I'm trying to get people to click these. I have no idea if it's effective because I only make a video that works on me, but it, it would work on me. Anyway, ne what next up is what's so great about that, which I feel like the title really explains the channel. It's good branding. <laughs> it's just so it's just uh, it's a woman who enthusiastically explains what's so great about that about a great number of things from like Bojack Horseman and Tuca and Birdie to Hamilton, The Beginner's Guide, Firewatch. Holy Motors, Untitled Goose Game, Night in the Woods, Marie Kondo, so on and so forth. I kind of bounced around. That I kind of almost had a list in my head when I started, and then I completely threw that list out of the way the moment I started talking. It really fucked myself over. <laughs> in wrapping behavior in, say, dog's clothing, its proximity to a human equivalent might not be immediately apparent, even to us. In Bojack Horseman, Mr. Peanut Butter, while being loving, optimistic, and enthusiastic, is also self-centered, rash, emotionally immature, and overly dependent on his partners. I mostly just sit right there. Sometimes I pretend to dig a little hole and then I take a nap. And when I hear your car in the driveway, it is the best part of my day. But for a long time, it's disguised by him being a dog. Those are dog traits. And so, just like our own behavioural habits or thought processes, it can take a while to recognise them for what they are. Here we find the specific nuances of humanity in exaggerated animal behaviour, a kind of subtlety through excess. Chris Davis is admittedly a relatively straightforward recommendation in that he's a guy who shows up every two weeks or so to unleash upon us about a one hour-ish review of a game or essay on a game that's kind of an in-depth discussion about what he thinks about it. In particular, a heavy emphasis on RPGs. In fact, he even has a series that he calls the History of Isometric CRPGs, where he starts. He tries to start from the very, very, very beginning and works his way all the way up to what I think is now on Divinity Original Sin. And that's a rel that's a pretty long series to go through if you're looking for just some, some good comfort food if you're a big CRPG fan. Either way, you can't make Pathologic 2 into a risk-free walking simulator. And at a risk of becoming one of those people, this probably isn't a bad thing. I'll talk about the story more soon, but the summary is that I really enjoyed it if enjoyed is the right word for a story like this one. Perhaps I'm glad I endured it is more appropriate. And that's kind of the point. For me, the story wouldn't be interesting without the struggle and the sense that you're enduring suffering. It's not a story I'd want to read or passively experience. All right, we're getting niche here, which is funny because we're nearing the end of the list and the subscriber counts are actually higher, although I guess when you have a ceiling, the context kind of warps anyway. Uh, but Do Not Eat talks a lot about city planning. And, so, and he also he uh, he talks a bit, a bit about uh, games like uh, City Skylines and or otherwise uses them as a demonstration of ideas that he is discussing, and he just kind of talks about like bridges and transportation and so on. And it's pretty interesting. In particular, uh, Elon Musk. He says he's a video about Elon Musk's Hyperloop that he was 
going on about and how that's just that whole idea is a disaster in the alaskan way viaduct replacement they had to dig a 120 foot shaft to lift out and replace the cutting head which delayed the project a full two years and uh even then straight up tunnel boring is the cheap part of tunneling what drives up costs are things like caverns and shafts so in subways that's for stations crossovers and switches and emergency exits and for the loop it'll at least be for crossovers between tunnels and the car elevators and the ramps these usually have to be mined by hand since they don't have a convenient circular cross section additionally fit out and ventilation and other work that make tunnels safe for human occupation are a very large part of the budget so these tunnels aren't as magic as advertised. Next up is Bob Vids, who I found a few years back because I was on this kick about this particular kind of, frankly, uh, kind of masturbatory practice of just kind of looking up videos of people dunking on CinemaSins because I had watched CinemaSins when they were brand new and they had like a handful of like five minute videos and they were just kind of snappy but they kept getting more and more bloated and they kept forcing themselves to make longer and longer and longer videos till every video is like 15 minutes 20 minutes and it's just like at that point he's just like making stuff up and i stopped watching the show the show because like every episode was just exhausting and the jokes weren't funny because they were mostly just repeating jokes from previous episodes over and over again like as memes basically and the like things they were saying about the mil films were just not true. So I certainly didn't want to watch a cinema sense about any video that I'd never watched yet, uh, any movie I'd never watched yet, because I would, it would just be lying to me about what the movie is like. Because uh, that's just it's that sort of Yahtzee style, like always negative response to a thing sort of feel. Although Yahtzee at least has more nuance to it than cinema sense ultimately does, and just sort of, it felt so mechanical and rote and. Change, uh, trend chasing and not really like it was accomplishing much else and it was really rough watching videos about like Mad Max Fury Road or this and that and then just being like wow you didn't watch the movie like you're an incompetent video maker what is wrong with you so I got on this kick of looking because I found out like people were making everything wrong with everything wrong with videos and I'm like oh I kind of love this idea just because if it, just because it was a good way to get my frustrations out for a while that's how i found sean and that's how i found bob vids and maybe one or two other channels because that was just a little thing for a bit there and these people all split off and do all their own interesting things besides that they're not just they're not just reaction channels to that but yeah if you want to go through that there is a series of videos about cinema sins and they are fun to watch but more recently he did a video on layers of fear and it's um distressing similarities to PT. She's truly one of the best antagonists in a horror game ever. Great job, Koji Pro, A+. You know what? She's going on the fridge. Is that a joke? Yeah, it's, it's for the video. Can you take it down? Yeah. In Layers of Fear, you learn the story of, what's her name? The wife? She doesn't have a name? All right. You learn the story of the wife, uh, wife whose husband drove her to suicide and who now spends the game haunting you. From the first moment I saw the wife in game, I was pretty shocked, but not for the reasons Bloober Team wanted. I've played some downright awful PT knockoffs in my time, but Layers of Fear was the first one that made me think, this is wrong. From the way the wife first appears in the game, to her movement, to her single eye, to the way she sobs, it's literally just Lisa. It's just Lisa. Blooper team control C, control V, Lisa. Kyle Calgren is a, I believe a guy with the glasses alumni, if I remember correctly. I found him on YouTube by happenstance, unrelated to that, via his uh, Who Gets to Be a Civilization video, which I liked a lot, and then I also quite enjoy his Washington DC Always Plays Itself video. Uh, and I, 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 there's some good stuff in here. There's a good video about the watermelon woman, and there's a heavy influence and emphasis on Shakespeare's influences and just the history of Shakespeare adaptations and Shakespeare everything because he's just a fan of Shakespeare. And uh, his most recent video actually was great. And it just it coincidentally just happened to make one very recently.
Wow, that was a redundant sentence. It's like we expect the act of going to the moon and beyond to bring a form of madness. It's a belief with ancient roots. It goes back to werewolves, men who turn wild in the light of the moon. In the Greek of the Gospel of Matthew, the word Selenia Zomenus was used to describe people afflicted with epilepsy, named for Selene, Greek goddess of the moon. Those overcome by madness were said to be moonstruck. The Romans held the same belief. Moonstruck in Latin became lunaticus, and in modern English, lunatic. Admittedly, once I reached the end of the list, <laughs> some of the later ones do weirdly feel like I'm trying to like flex on them. Like, haha, see, I got a higher number than you on the bullshit website because of reasons. It's a, it's not the intention, but <laughs> it's it's it does feel vaguely like that's what I'm accidentally doing with some of these. Uh, but last on the list, I'm a little tired. <laughs> it's been a, this has been a project today. Is Maggie May Fish, who has a number of different projects, but in, in particular, the ones I remember are ones that are about uh, like evangelical Christians, in particular, like the bizarre funded movies that they make that are often about these really creepy versions of Christianity where they're inextricable. They're, they're inseparably tied to capitalism and the seeking of additional funds and money and how money is basically happiness and so on to the point where they can seem to seemingly not discuss any concept without discussing it via money and it's distressing it's like these kirk cameron movies and the, like there's the there's the one that's fire there's the, there's fireproof which is the one about relationships that's most but but it's actually about money but then there's the really creepy videos by kirk, kirk cameron about like christmas and just like the fetishistic obsession of just commerce and spending and buying being the point of like all that all those lessons you hear as a kid where it's like christmas isn't actually about getting and giving presents it's about love none of that no kirk cameron just shits all over that doesn't give a shit about all those lessons no it's about the money it's about the gifts it's about flexing it's about it's just about spending for the sake of spending it's just like ah and it's it's a it's a trip and then she's currently doing a, a ongoing series on Zack Snyder's approach to the DC films and the entire thought process that he seems to bring to it that is potentially the explanation for why it all just doesn't ring true if you are fans of heroes like Superman and how this is just a version of him that is kind of a bastardization of everything that he stands for. Hooray! Someone's in the Love Dare book anyways! It must be a relationship advice, right? And, and spiritual advice. On the surface, it may seem that way. Whatever you put your time, energy, and money into will become more important to you. It's hard to care for something you're not investing in. Buy your wife something that says you were thinking of her today. But notice how the language of this book is never about feelings or relationships or communication. And more often than not, it's about money. That one passage mentioned money, investing, and buying stuff. Money, money, money! Everything is a transaction, and we will see this transactional mindset pay off at the climax of the movie. Well, that was a project that took that took a few hours to edit through, but it was it was a fun change of pace for the day. A nice little break from the usual daily routine and all that. If you made it this far in the video, thanks for indulging me. This was just kind of a little project thing. Hooray! Ninety thousand subscribers and all that. Here's to ten. Here's to one hundred thousand and. I guess the silver play button? Is this, that's the silver one, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. That's, I didn't, I never thought I'd get this far. It's weird. We're pretty much here because of Patreon. Uh, and a lot of these channels are funded by Patreon too. Like a lot of these people do what they do because it's suddenly unusually feasible to fund yourself at this scale because audience participation and funding can just, make up that extra bit that you need in order to do any of this because uh youtube uh ad revenue certainly does not do that for you so hopefully you found some videos or even a lot of videos that you found interesting and intriguing and you want to dig deeper and watch the rest of the videos and then maybe even more videos on that channel and subscribe to that channel or maybe subscribe to all the channels that might be a little that might be a little ambitious but uh yeah this is good shit all around and it's worth checking out Feel free to bookmark this video 
or or favored or whatever and like come back to it periodically to like make your way through more of that list because it obviously uh it's a project if you want to check out all these different channels it'll take a few goes to actually get through them all but i felt like this was a, a fun and different way to celebrate a milestone i think it's i don't think i've done this before not quite in this form at least i've definitely not edited a video in this style before this was this was definitely its own bizarre weird experiment that was kind of fun to do um I don't, I don't do call to actions that much, but hey, if you made it this far in the video, please go ahead and hit a, hit it with a like. Uh, it just helps promote the video, in particular via uh, my existing audience, because people often don't necessarily watch everything via the subscription page, but instead watch it via like the main page. And so if it's getting a lot of, of comments and a lot of likes and so on, then it might do a better job at reaching the rest of my own audience because that's how YouTube works now. It's just kind of weird that way. Go ahead and, and if you want to participate in the experiment, uh, the project, you can go ahead and go tr find your own channels that you are currently watching that have less than 90,000 subscribers that you would like to share in the comments down below, which also does the whole comment algorithm thing, which helps promote the video and all that. You know, it's a feedback loop. I don't, it's weird doing a call to action. I don't, I don't do call to actions really besides when I'm like, Hey, here comes the new Patreon vote or whatever the hell. Um, so yeah, this was it. I'm, I'm going to make this the only video today, both because it was a time consuming thing. So it's a replacement for a normal day's work anyway. And also because I want people to watch this and give them time to actually try to pursue some of these videos if they find something interesting without being distracted by all the other videos that I might have otherwise uploaded in a given day. If you are one of the people featured in this video, and you got this far especially, uh, hi, thanks for watching. Uh, let me know if you want me to edit out your video from the video or anything. I don't really know if I'm like stepping on any toes or crossing any lines by just kind of featuring people's clips like this. I kind of figure, hey, I'm. It's it's it, it's from a, it's meant for a good way, and that it's promoting these people's channels, and. I'm not going to monetize this video, so I'm not making any ad revenue off it myself. And I'm tr I am tried to edit each clip in a way where it does not function as a replacement for the video that it's from. So that people wouldn't just watch that clip and be like, oh, that's enough. And then just not bother watching the final video. Like if they find it intriguing, they should hopefully pursue the final video. And hopefully subscribe to your channel is the idea. Uh, but yeah, I don't necessarily know. I don't always know what the like the, there's cultural faux pas because being a small YouTube channel with not a lot of connections, I don't really feel particularly connected to like the larger YouTube community, and so like I kind of just took a risk here a little bit. And while I was thinking about it, uh, while I was in the process of doing this for hours, I kind of started thinking like, I wonder if some of these people might not be entirely happy with this. But at that point, I'm like, well, I'm already this far into the project, and I, I don't know. People do response videos all the time like this isn't massively divergent, I guess. But yeah, let me know if you want me to remove your particular clip and all that. Also, uh, <laughs> this little side thing, not to you specifically, just everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm making the comments uh, moderation. They're, they're gonna be held for moderation. It's a trap, because I know that I've, I've touched on a few sensitive-ish things via the suggestions in this video. So when the chuds come out, and reveal themselves because they get really mad about like the part 20 minutes in or whatever. It's a trap and I get to ban them again. This is, I, I do this every now and then where I just have like, I just kind of touch on some political stuff for a bit and I, I'm not gonna stop. So when people get angry because they're in shitty parts of the field and they get mad about mentions of inclusion or whatever the fuck, then I'm just like, ha ha, he, he, the, the fucking, it's like whack-a-mole. He, he, he showed up and then you just hit him on the head and it's gone. Ha ha, one more done. So that'll be fun. That'll be fun for tomorrow when I'm, when this video goes live and I'm dealing with some of those people. So yeah, I'll be manually approving all of the comments in part because I don't want people to, uh, suck. And whenever I talk about stuff like this, unfortunately, that's when people tend to suck. So... There's that. All right, this is this video is this video is long enough. <laughs> uh, if if you were one of the people who made this content, thank you. You've been helping me get through all sorts of things, including 2020, which fuck, man. Mm -hmm.